Welcome to today's virtual tour of the permafrost tunnel that will include highlights of current research and changing landscapes of permafrost in the Arctic. This program is made possible by collaborators from The Ohio State University, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Woodville Climate Research Center, and University of Alaska Fairbanks. My name is Jason Servanek, and I'll be behind the scenes with my colleague Joe Hiltebrand today, making sure everything goes smoothly. Before we start, we have a few short announcements to share so that everybody can have an enjoyable program. Automatic captions have been enabled for this session. You have the ability to enable or disable the captions on your screen to suit your needs with the CC button located at the bottom of the Zoom window. We definitely wanna hear from you, so please feel free to post questions for presenters in the Q&A. We'll be checking throughout today's program, so don't hold back until the Q&A opens. You can post those throughout. We'll also be allowing you, because of the size of today's audience, to upvote questions. So if there's something you see that you really wanna ask about, that'll help us prioritize the questions. We do have a few hundred people on the call today. We'll also would invite your participation throughout the program in the form of some quick surveys. And you'll have your first chance at one of those right now. So I'm gonna ask Joe to open up our first poll, asking who has had some experience with permafrost. So if you wanna take about 30 seconds and answer that question, give us a sense of what the audience's experience with some of what we're gonna talk about today is. Yeah, about 10 more seconds on that. Okay, Joe, go ahead and share the results of that poll. So it looks like of the 450 people we have in attendance, about 64% have no experience with permafrost and about 36% do. Before we begin the formal program, I would like to acknowledge that the land that the Ohio State University occupies is the ancestral and contemporary territory of the Shawnee, Potawatomi, Delaware, Miami, Peoria, Seneca, Wyandotte, and Ojibwe and Cherokee peoples. We want to honor the resiliency of these tribal nations and recognize the historical context that has and continues to affect indigenous peoples of this land. At this time, I would like to welcome Tom Douglas to facilitate our tour of the permafrost tunnel. So Tom, if you can go ahead and turn your video on, your audio, awesome. Uh, Dr. Tom Douglas is a research scientist in Fairbanks, Alaska, who studies snow, ice, and permafrost. One of his favorite places is the permafrost tunnel. He has a 15-year-old daughter, and he likes to ski, run rivers, and work around the house. And I'd like to thank Tom for all the work he's done to get this virtual tour together and also to guide us today. Tom's asked us to put a piece of trivia up and take a few seconds and answer that. So take a second and see if, you, if you've been listening closely. You already have some clues here, but where are the permafrost tunnels located in the world? Give everybody about 20 seconds here to get those results in. Slowly getting there. Okay, Joe, I think it's ready to share. Let's see what we've got. It's pretty uh, pretty two-sided here. Tom, you're either in Alaska or you're in Norway, one of the two. And without awesome. further, further ado, I'm gonna be driving this tour and, and Tom, take it away. Show us what you have here. Yeah, thank you, everybody. So I think those are that's a pretty good trivia result. I am talking to you from Fairbanks, Alaska, right down the road from the tunnel. So those of you that picked Fairbanks, good job. Oslo, Norway wasn't a bad second choice, though. Uh, Norway, you know, is, is a Nordic country and it gets quite cold there. Um, but we're happy to be with you from Fairbanks. And so welcome. Uh, again, my name is Tom Douglas. I work with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Cold Regions Research and Engineering Laboratory. And there's about 200 of us that study snow, ice, and permafrost. And today, of course, we'll be focused on permafrost 
and more importantly, the tunnel. And, and, and this is this uh, sort of world-class resource and engineering and research um, resource that we have. And we're gonna kind of take you in the tunnel, above the tunnel. We're gonna bring in some variety of experts to tell you about bones and microbes and landscape change and how people live on the land and whatnot. And, and it's really exciting. And so thank you all for taking your time. And um, I'll, I'll guess I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about the tunnel. So it's located a little bit north of Fairbanks. It's excavated into a, a hill slope. You can kind of see the picture up there on the left, kind of painting around the parking lot. And uh, the tunnel was originally started to be excavated in the early 1960s. So it's about 60 years old at this point. And we also do a bunch of other work out there. We test uh, ways to keep the ground frozen. We test infrastructure and whatnot. But first of all, let's start with a sort of a definition. What is permafrost? And, and the way we define it is we call it a frozen earth material that has remained frozen for multiple years. So uh, it can be bedrock. It can be soil, it can be ice, um, you'll see bones, um, and we'll talk about those today, uh, chunks of grass, organic matter, silt, clay, kind of anything you can imagine sort of planet Earth is composed of. If it's frozen for multiple years, we call it permafrost. The Corps of Engineers manages the permafrost tunnel. Uh, we do a lot of outreach. Um, this is the first time we've done something like this. This is really exciting. We do host a lot of people at the tunnel, um, and that includes a lot of scientists and engineers um, that bring their sort of variety of tools to study. Um, a couple of just quick things, you know, gold mining and then oil exploration and infrastructure have always been on and around permafrost. And so we've had to sort of study that. Indigenous people up here have lived for thousands of years on permafrost and, and they use it and they know quite a bit about it. Um, more recently, things like Mars and lunar exploration, there's permafrost on those, um, you know, other planetary bodies and then sort of ecology and sort of landscape change and climate warming impacts. Um, so I think at this point, Jason, why don't we keep going left and we'll head inside. So we're gonna basically, you can imagine, we're gonna sort of walk in, it says enter permafrost tunnel. We're gonna, we're walking into a hill and where we first enter the door, um, it's about 18,000 years old, the soils that are there. And then the very back kind of bottom of the tunnel is about 42,000 years old. So it's a bit of a time machine for us. We can go above the tunnel where we're going to go towards the end of this tour um, and actually get what we would call modern or sort of more recent formation kind of up top there where you see the trees. Um, but yeah, let's kind of open that door and head in, please. All right, so if you've ever been to the tunnel, when you first walk in that door, it smells like anything from, I don't know, some people say kind of barnyard animals or uh, French cheese. It's a very organic, almost like that smell of wet leaves in the fall. Um, Robin Barbado will be talking later and she'll tell you that that's basically microbes and bacteria kind of actively doing their thing, even though they're cold and frozen and you know tens of thousands of years old. Um, it was originally excavated with a sort of a mining, a big drilling machine that sort of ripped the material into little chunks, and then they got pulled outside. And over the last 15 years, we've been expanding quite a bit. So that's a new section of tunnel you can see right there. Um, and along the walls, pretty soon you'll start to see things that look like cracks. Those are pieces of ice. Um, you'll see frozen soil, chunks of rock, and we'll even see some bones. And, and Patrick Druckenmiller will talk about those a little bit later. You'll also notice we kind of use the wall, so that's all frozen, um, We, but we sort of use it almost as if it's rock or wood or whatnot. We attach the electrical boxes and things to it. We have sensors for air quality. We have backup lights and various other sort of safety considerations, and we just kind of drill that all into the wall there. It's kind of the only tunnel like this on Earth, so a lot of what we're doing is uh, fairly new and novel, but again, it's 60 years old, so we've been able to learn you know, for quite a bit of time kind of what works and what doesn't. So now we're going to kind of zoom in here, and, and this little section right here the, where you see these folks in the, with the flashlights are looking, um, we're going to kind of zoom in. There's actually some animal bones right in there, um, and there's some rocks and things, and these were all deposited, you can imagine sort of a river gully that filled up maybe suddenly, so a big storm or um, snow melt in the spring picked up you know, bones and rocks and sticks and things that might have been slightly uphill and basically brought them in and kind of dragged them down. Um, and so that's why we find these things kind of frozen and stored in there. And Jason, do we have a couple pictures of, um, I think we can bring these up and you all can do this tour yourself. There's quite a bit more here. 
that is uh, that's a mammoth tusk fragment. So mammoths were these, you know, very large animals that roamed sort of the ice age tundra, you know, tens of thousands of years ago. If you've seen pictures of them, they had really long tusks, you know, five, 10 feet long. Um, in this case, it's just a little piece of a tusk. It almost sort of looks like a broken piece of a stick or a tree. Um, their tusks kind of grew that way over time. And we just found this fragment kind of um, hanging out of one of the walls and um, it's since it's kind of fallen out and, and now we can kind of study it and, and archive it. And Jason, is there another photo? So kind of zooming back out. Yeah, there we go. That's a step bison horn. So these kind of look like they're extinct. Um, and again, Patrick will tell you more about all of this. Um, they, they, I kind of think of them, they look like a buffalo or a bison, um, but with almost more of like a Texas longhorn style horn. And we find, we found many of these horns in the tunnel, um, which lets us know that this, this time period, about 18 or so thousand years ago, in this case, they were roaming around the tundra quite a bit. Um, and obviously they would sort of, again, kind of die upstream and get pulled downstream and deposited as part of the permafrost. Now, Tom, you mentioned, you know, permafrost, frozen soils. I saw a great video you posted on social media yesterday of the amount of effort it takes to drill into this rock, this material, even though it's not rock, it is, it is tough. I mean, you're using some pretty heavy duty equipment to do that. Yeah, so if anyone, I mean, I'm sure everyone's sort of been on lake ice before, and if you definitely, if you've fallen on, on lake or if you're an ice skater uh, at the rink, it's pretty solid, right? So trying to get samples of that does require special equipment. Um, we use a variety of coring equipment, and, and some of it, uh, that core we used yesterday is about 60 years old. So again, people really have designed and, and been studying this stuff for a long time, and, and some of these tried and true methods, they just work really well. So um, yeah, we got some samples for Robin, who's going to talk in a little bit, and she'll probably tell you about what she does with those. Um, but yeah, we, it's 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 kind of always fun to go back in there and 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 start some new knowledge discovery. So Tom, a question came in: Why this location? Of all the locations they could select in the world for permafrost, what, why here? That's a great question. So a couple things: one, it's it's near a large town, Fairbanks. I guess when I say large, uh, I should I should let you know there's about. 80,000 people in Fairbanks. So I'm sure a lot of you live in much larger cities, but for Alaska, that's pretty big. Um, it's near the road system. Um, we we work for the Army Corps of Engineers and it was a plot of land the Army actually owned um, and was able to use for training and excavation. Um, it also, uh, because gold miners had kind of removed some of the material basically right near where our front door is now, it just was a very easy kind of no brainer place to keep digging. Um, and so kind of all those reasons came together um, and uh, it's just been a, a, just a wonderful place to work and, and study again for 60 years. Great question though, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Should we go on to the next next location on the tour? Yeah, please do. And, and as we're doing that, I'll, I'll mention a little bit about, you know, why would we take cores of permafrost? So um, of course, as I said, it sort of represents different periods of time. So we can get a sense for what was the vegetation like? What was the climate like? What were the, you know, the microbes in the soil? Were there trace metals? You know, what were those concentrations? Atmospheric deposition of things? Again, sort of before human intervention, but so what are some of these pristine backgrounds? Then things like how, how might we find water on the moon or Mars? Um, how might we better engineer and design equipment or, or buildings or roads on permafrost? And in this spot right here, you can see those little black dots um, those are like the cores we were collecting yesterday. So we have a big cylinder that goes in the wall and it removes a core. Those cores, their diameter is about the size of a Coca-Cola can, but they can be two or three feet long. And uh, you'll see in some cases, we got three in a row, in some cases, just one. Some of that depends on maybe what types of statistics someone might want to do with their analysis, or if they want to make a bunch of different measurements that require sending things to different laboratories or doing different protocols. And so uh, if as you wander through the tunnel, there are little holes everywhere um, for people trying to study rocks or ice or bones or whatnot. Um, Would there be different ages to the material at the bottom versus the top here, Tom? Yeah, you can imagine sort of planet Earth tends to, to deposit things sort of bottom up. So yeah, where those people's feet are versus where their heads are. Um, you can do some kind of quick math on this. Um, I'm going to shift to metric. Our, our sort of windblown or dust deposition rates here are about a millimeter a year which is really small, you remember a millimeter, that's just like about a, you know, a little bit thicker than your fingernail. Um, 
a millimeter a year. So that's a meter in a thousand years, right? Because there's a thousand millimeters in a meter. So, um, and a meter is about three feet. So you think your average sort of six foot tall person, they might be standing and representing about 2000 years worth of deposition. So we can kind of go back in time um, in that regard too. And quick related question, we had a, we had somebody ask about what kind of a coring equipment do you use in permafrost versus, you know, what you'd use on ice or something like that? Yeah. You mentioned the equipment was 60 years old, some of it, but. Yeah, there's a couple subtle differences. So the one that we use often is called a SIPRE core, S-I-P-R-E, and that's an acronym. And it, it looks like a long kind of barrel, uh, almost like a, a poster tube. Um, or you can imagine maybe a big piece of PVC pipe, you know, that kind of plastic pipe you often see for drain spouts and things. It's about that size and has some really sharp teeth that we screw to the bottom of it. And then we use a, a small, basically kind of like what an ice fisherman or woman would use. Um, it's just a power auger that spins this thing rapidly and in it goes. Um, and that video I posted yesterday, yeah, you can see that the thing's bouncing around. You got to really kind of push on it. It's not super easy, but it works. And so um, that's kind of the technology that a lot of us use is these, it's called a SIPRI core. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. And why don't we zoom in this spot? There's kind of a cool little feature here. Um, I think I'll just, I'll pose a question quickly. What does that look like? And I look, I know it looks kind of gray and brownish and dark, um, but before I answer, maybe kind of ponder what you think that looks like. And then I'll give you a couple clues. It's green. You normally see it on the surface of planet earth. And in this case, it's actually upside down. And so the answer is grass. Um, that's a, a, that's a chunk of, of green grass. It's about the size of maybe a dinner table that you might have at your house. And we have kind of a fun hypothesis of how this ended up here. Again, it's upside down, right? Grass doesn't grow downward like that. All of its roots are down there. And in this case, what we think is that where that person was standing about 20,000 years ago was probably a small pond or, or a little lake, you know, or, or part of a stream full of water and a chunk of material fell over upside down into that water. Um, you know, rivers are eroding, creeks, slumps and things like that. And so it fell in and it must have been kind of late fall and it froze very quickly because it obviously still has its chlorophyll. Um, you know, when you mow your lawn at home or something, you'll see within a week or two, it kind of turns brown and dies. So this happened probably pretty quickly. That water body then froze, um, locked that in there, and it's basically never been thawed since until we started digging and probing around there. So um, a kind of a, a, a neat example. So now basically we know what type of grass um, these mammoths and uh, steppe bison were maybe munching on and sleeping on and, and wandering atop um, about 20,000 years ago. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, and I, I think um, at this point, uh, Jason, do we, were we shifting to Patrick or were there any last? We are, we are. We actually have a little, uh, we're gonna go ahead and have a little quiz that Patrick has given us. Awesome. Well, thanks, everybody. I'll be back in a little bit, and uh, I'll, I'll leave you in good hands with Patrick. Hey, Patrick. Hello, everybody. So, Patrick, before we uh, before we formally introduce you here, I'm going to have Joe bring up our quiz. So, Patrick went ahead and built a quiz for us. So, take about 30 seconds and answer this one. Mammoth tusks do uh, which of the following? Can grow several feet each year, are a modified incisor tooth, are replaced each year, or only grown by males? Results are coming in fast and furious. I'll be uh, I'll be real interested to see the answers. We got about three hundred people that have replied. We got about two hundred more to go. Okay, as as those start to come in, I will go ahead and introduce Patrick. Let me do one little adjustment here on my screen. So Dr. Patrick Druckenmiller uh, is gonna share some of the research on permafrost and what objects, objects found within that permafrost tell us about ecosystems in this part of the country in the past. Dr. Druckenmiller is a vertebrate paleontologist. He's the director of the University of Alaska Museum of the North and Professor of Geology in the Department of Geosciences at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. 
with that, Joe, I'm going to let you go ahead and close out that poll and share the results with everybody. Looks as though we have some pretty strong feelings about it being a modified tooth, followed up a little bit by uh, several feet a year growth or replaced each year. All right. Uh, I'll let you take it away from there. <laughs> okay, good. Um, I'm happy to see, I think the, the majority, uh, majority of people got it right in that case. Yes, it's a tusk is actually, it's a modified second incisor on a mammoth. Other types of tusks on things like a walrus or a, like a walrus tusk is a modified canine, but on a mammoth, a tusk is a modified incisor, which is pretty hard to imagine. One of the teeth there in the front of your mouth growing to be about that big around up to 10 feet or more long and growing out of your upper jaw, but that's, that's what it is. So um, for those of you who got it right, well done. So I'm happy to be talking a little bit about one of the really fun and fascinating things about the tunnel when it, when it was initially um, excavated out of the earth, right away they started to find bones sticking out of the wall of the tunnel. This was pretty exciting and as it turns out, the tunnel is a great place to talk about the animals that lived at the time that this permafrost was forming during the latter part of the last ice age, we'll say here around like 20,000 years ago. And really uh, what the tunnel is preserving in those, in those bones is it's really preserving um, really what was an ice age ecosystem. And this painting, uh, it's kind of a famous painting. It used to be at the Smithsonian in um, Washington, DC. This painting depicts sort of an ideal, idealized scene of all the different kinds of large mammals that lived in interior Alaska, or let's say again, around 20,000 years ago during the height of the last part of the ice age. And I think the thing to notice right away that's really remarkable is when you think Alaska, you think cold and you might think all of Alaska was under glacial ice, but in fact, it wasn't. This view would be looking sort of to the south of Fairbanks into the mountains. The mountains had mountain glaciers. And in fact, there were glaciers also in the, the mountain range to the north of us called the Brooks Range. But most vast portion of interior Alaska was completely ice free during the last ice age. It's kind of maybe counterintuitive. And in fact, it was a giant cold grassland that we call the Mammoth Steppe. And it extends all the way from Alaska across the Bering Land Bridge and even into Asia um, and, and Northern Europe. And in that landscape were a whole host of kind of famous Ice Age animals. And there are what I call the big three that we find preserved in the tunnel. And that includes steppe bison that Tom mentioned. This is a large extinct bison, woolly mammoth, and a kind of a horse, at least one kind of a horse that we call the Beringian horse. And there were a host of other predators. I'm just going to pull out one and note the, uh, the existence of a lion, actually a Beringian lion, which is kind of amazing to think they were running around Alaska here not that long ago. Next slide, please. Tom mentioned one of the most amazing things about the tunnel. When you first walk into the tunnel, what hits you first and foremost, besides maybe the cold air, is the smell. And that smell um, is actually um, is actually the you know organic remains, bits of a plant and, and other animal material that's that's found in the soil there in the sediment, and a lot of it is plant material. So if you look closely into the wall of the tunnel, a lot of the material is what we call <clears throat> what we call lus. It's a fine grain silt, and it's got a lot of organic matter in it that's decomposing and it stinks. You'll also see in the gravel, especially, you see wood. Um, Tom mentioned the fact that you can even find things like grass. That's, that's not just any old grass, it's green grass. And the reason that all this is made possible is because this organic matter, wood and animal parts, was frozen quickly soon after it was laid down. And um, so in addition to all this plant matter, we also have bones. Next slide. Um, one of, uh, one of, I'd say the most abundant remains that we find in the tunnel are from a steppe bison. So steppe, they're noticed it's spelled S-T-E-P, 
PPE. That means basically this dry grassland environment. This is a bison that's now extinct, but closely related to the living plains and woodland bison. And their bones are some of the most abundant remains in the tunnel wall. And you can see my hand for scale there next to some of the different things we find. It almost looks like you can just grab one of those bones and pull it out of the wall. But in fact, you can't because remember, this is permafrost. Those bones are sticking out, but they're embedded in solidly frozen ground. It feels like they're embedded in concrete. It's so hard. But we find uh, a lot of leg bones because they're very resistant and um, they preserve very well. But what's really remarkable is that horn fragment that we saw before. Now, a horn is actually two things. It's, it's on a bison. There's a bony core. And on the outside of the horn is a sheath made of the same material as your fingernail. Now, normally anywhere else in the world, if a bison dies, all of that, that sheath actually rots away, just like the skin and the, the other flesh. But when it's frozen rapidly in permafrost, it can be preserved. So it's a very, for us, it's a common thing to find everywhere else. It's very unusual. Next, please. That's really important because um, some of the best example of permafrost preservation um, comes from right here around Fairbanks, Alaska, like this mummified entire step bison, and I won't call it a skeleton, it's really a carcass. It's a mummy, um, it's, a, it's a bison uh, that died and was buried rapidly and, and frozen for the soil. And that's, this bison is actually over 50,000 years old, and it looks like it almost died yesterday. And it preserves the skin and the muscle and it's um, actually, we call it Blue Babe, and it's on display at our museum in Fairbanks at the Museum of the North. And it's blue because of a coating of a mineral called Vivianite. Um, but what's so remarkably well-preserved that it even on the skin shows evidence of how it died. And here's the neat part. When we look at the back part, um, kind of on the rump of that skeleton of the carcass, it shows big scratch marks and in fact, there's also bite marks in the head. This is consistent with being killed by one of those Beringian lions. So this is a 50,000 year old bison that was killed by a lion and rapidly buried. Just remarkable stuff. There's very few places in the world you can find such amazing fossils. So a question Next related slide. to that came up. Is it, is it yeah. safe to assume that the wood in the tunnel wouldn't be petrified then? It would actually That's just be correct. dried out. That wood is, is so well preserved, you could pull it out of the wall, take it outside and build a campfire, no problem. It would burn just like you uh, picked it up in the forest floor today. Yeah, good question. Um, and then one of the kind of, the, certainly the biggest animal that we find in the tunnel is the woolly mammoth. So this is really a very close relative of the living elephants, particularly the living Indian elephant. It's a grass eater. And it was big. It was a big furry elephant. Um, and one of the bones I've got my hand next to there is from the from the humerus. That's the, the elbow end of, of the upper arm bone or the upper leg bone for a mammoth. And these bones are also fairly common in the tunnel. And so are fragments of tusks. And Tom mentioned a, a chunk of tusk that was found in the tunnel. And I, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the cool science that you can do when you find remains of things like tusks. Um, next slide, please. Um, so here's a little story of a cool science that you can do with a, with a mammoth tusk. Um, I first of all want to mention that this, this beautiful painting here was one that uh, we had commissioned. Um, it's by an uh, Anchorage artist named James Haven. So I credit him for this wonderful artwork. Um, so as we saw from our quiz, tusks are a, a, really just a big modified tooth. It's a modified incisor. And the tusks grow very slowly through life. When you look at a tusk like this, the, uh, the oldest part the part that was present when the animal is very young is way out at the tip. And the, the newest part, the part that's growing is up right where the tusk enters into the skull there. And what's, what makes them amazing for science is that they lay down every single day, they grow a tiny little bit and they lay down a little 
tiny growth layer every single day of the year. And in fact, you can add those up and you can even see what are annual lines. In fact, they grow about five to 10 centimeters every year. And you can see on this picture, some of those clear yearly growth bands. And we can actually tell that in this particular tusk, um, which was found actually in Northern Alaska, this particular tusk came from an animal that died when it was about 27 years old. Next, please. And so as they, as they, um, they lay down, they kind of grow again from the base, from the tip down in the base, they, they continue to emerge slowly through time. And what you can do um, as they grow every single day, they record tiny little chemical differences. And in this case, isotopic differences that tell us about their diet, the climate they lived in and even where they were living and so on how they moved. So what you can do is you can take a tusk you can split it lengthwise and you can sample it using this fancy little machine here that we have in our stable isotope lab at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And those letters stand for laser ablation, multi-collector, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, spectrometer. But you don't need to know that. It's a really cool machine that um, samples for different kinds of versions of elements in the tusk. Next, please. And if we sample along the length of the tusk, from the youngest part when it was a baby all the way to the time it died, these, these little lines show variations in one of the types of elements called strontium. Next, please. And what's amazing is we can compare the variations in strontium recorded in its tusk with what we know exists a variation on the landscape to tell how the animal moved through its life across the landscape. And what we learned is that this particular animal probably was born north of Fairbanks and made annual migrations around the Brooks Range in Northern Alaska um, to the what we call the North Slope and back and forth and back and forth. Um, amazing story, really uh, a tusk is really just like a diary, it records everyday life for an animal. Um, so that's just one little example of really cool science that you can get from, um, from tusks and the bones we find in the tunnel. Well, Patrick, we had a lot of questions come in about the Beringian lions. Oh, okay, um, yeah. So two of them, two quick questions are, are there any modern ancestor of those in the world today? And did they, they're depicted as having short legs. Is, is that accurate? Yeah, they have, um, these, these lions are actually kind of a cave lion. Um, these lions are closely related. In fact, they were thought to be just a subspecies of the modern African lion, which is very, very widely distributed um, and so, yes, they're very closely related to the modern African lion. And in fact, remember Blue Babe, um, people know today from uh, observations of lions that they kill um, in a pack, right, in, a, um, in a pride by one of the lions will grab the muzzle, the mouth of the animal it's trying to kill and they actually hold on and suffocate. And that's what the bite marks on the, the Blue Babe uh, bison told us about how it died. So there's still hunting in exactly the same way. And are there, one last question for you, are there any human remains that have been found in the tunnel uh, or in other work you've done? You know, some of the sediments in the tunnel are potentially young enough to have archeological evidence. So evidence for humans that lived at the same time in the late ice age as these other animals. But uh, to my knowledge, there's never been any evidence for humans uh, preserved in the tunnel. But in interior Alaska, at other sites, there are evidence of humans as far back as almost 14,000 years ago, and at the, even evidence of utilizing mammoths. So um, they did coexist with some of these large animals and, and certainly were eating them. Well, thank you very much, Patrick. I know you are on travel in the lower 48 right now, so we will uh, let you sign off today and get back to your other business. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, that was great. Thanks. Tom, we'll welcome you back for the next part of the tunnel tour. I'm gonna pick up right where we left off. Awesome, thank you. And, and Patrick is always such a wonderful wealth of information. I, I've talked to them quite a bit and I always learn more things every time. So the really exciting stuff, thank you. All right, we're now gonna go check out an ice wedge. I think we've mentioned uh, the different sort of types of ice we've seen in the tunnel. Uh, we've talked a little bit about infrastructure, 
Um, we're going to kind of focus on that a little bit more. So there's a couple things to see right here. Um, one is you can kind of see uh, sort of a tan, sort of a frozen, that's a silt material. And then you can see a really shiny sort of dark brown-ish feature right there. And you can kind of tell that looks like ice. And if you start seeing how large that is, um, I could tell you the, the roof of the tunnel is about 20 feet and the width is about 30 feet. So this piece of ice is, you know, probably this, you know, the size of someone's house or whatnot. It's almost completely water ice. When we say that, what we mean is if you if you brought this up to above, you know, 32 Fahrenheit or zero Celsius above freezing point, um, it's just going to turn into, it almost looks like iced tea, basically water. And so imagine if that happened, um, that huge area right there is going to go from ice to water. Um, that water can flow away. It can evapotranspire. It can seep through cracks. And so if you had something constructed on top of that, you'd have some big challenges. Um, Jason, if you could go a little bit to the right, you'll see these kind of horizontal lines. Yeah, right in the middle of this, you'll see more ice wedge to the right. There's also those horizontal lines. Yeah, those are different periods of time where the ground surface was maybe very close to those water lines and we have this seasonal freeze and thaw that occurs and water would get stuck basically at the top of the permafrost. It can't go down any further. And then it'll freeze and as more material is added to the top, the depth of that freezing layer rises with the you know, amount of that material. And so we basically leave other pockets of ice in there. Um, this is also pretty high ice content material, but not the same as the wedges. I think it's just important to see this, what we would call heterogeneity or sort of unpredictable nature. Another thing I wanna point out, and I'll bet there might even be questions about it. You'll see those weird curving, they almost look like scratch marks in the wall. Um, yeah, right, there's some of them there. They're almost sort of some are curved, some look like, what that is, is the way, this is a newer section of tunnel that we excavated just a couple of years ago because we wanted to expand. And we, the way we do that is we have this big kind of spinning drum on the back of a piece of equipment and it has all these little teeth on it. It kind of looks like, um, oh, I think about maybe some dinosaur had a tail like that. Probably Patrick could tell us which one. And, and so as it spun, it basically ground this material down into little pieces we could then remove. But what you're seeing there, all those weird little scratch marks are actually scratch marks from that, that, that tunneling machine. Um, so kind of back to ice wedges and infrastructure, um, you know, across Alaska and other sort of cold kind of Arctic areas, we're seeing more and more sort of the climate's warming and that is affecting infrastructure. Um, right near the cursor there, you'll see some holes. Those are some cores we took, um, probably trying to measure ice content in that ice wedge compared to the other material around it. Because again, we want to try to help guide people maybe how they might build on this or how they might avoid it if they want to, how they might keep it frozen. Those are kind of your options. You, you don't build on an area that looks difficult. Um, you put some extra kind of engineering and thermal controls to prevent your building from you know, warming up the ground and allowing this ice to melt, or you keep the ground sort of artificially frozen by protecting it. And um, it, there's a lot of places where we're starting to see at, at the ground surface, and we're gonna show you some photos in a second, um, places where people's houses, their infrastructure are being affected by this warming. In the Fairbanks area, there was a question before. So our mean annual temperature in the Fairbanks area is now almost zero C, almost 32 Fahrenheit, right near that freeze point, thaw point. Um, we've warmed about three degrees since the 1970s. Um, and Patrick was talking about kind of 15, 20,000 years ago when, when, when it, all these animals were on the tundra and maybe right before humans came in, um, it was about nine degrees colder back then. So those people and those animals were really hardy. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as it's been slowly warming and sort of more rapidly since the 1970s, we're having kind of a hard time, um, you know, helping people with infrastructure that maybe was built before that warming occurred. Um, and so I, think we're going to go up to the surface now. Um, well, there, we'll, we'll, see those, we'll see those infrastructure pictures in the next scene in just a sec. But we had a few questions come in asking about what about the tunnel temperature? Is that well below freezing at freezing? Yeah, thank you. We, we like to keep it about minus three or four Celsius in there. So maybe like 26 degrees, um, a little colder than your refrigerator, but maybe not quite as cold as your freezer. Um, the reason for that is as you approach the thaw point, um, the material starts to kind of bend and move. And so we want to prevent that. So what we do is in the winter time, 
Um, Fairbanks has a quite a cold winter. Um, we have these big doors that actually that front door we walked in the beginning and we have big fans that basically just suck all that cold air right into the tunnel, we kind of blow it in. And that helps us keep it frozen. And then in the summer, we close those doors up. We seal it pretty tight. Um, there's a small door people can walk through. Um, but we run some big kind of what we call chillers, like big refrigeration chillers. And then we also use these fans to kind of blow the cold air around the tunnel. So we do keep it artificially a little bit colder than, than maybe the ground wants to be now. So good question. Then, Thank you. And before we move on to this ice wedges portion, somebody's asked about the maximum size of an ice wedge and is there a uniform distribution between them or is it just haphazard? Oh, awesome. So the way I describe, so maximum size, they can be hundreds of feet tall. Um, the, our tallest ones are probably 30 or 40 feet tall, but there are some other places um, in Alaska and Siberia um, where they're quite a bit bigger than that. Um, and the way they form, I should kind of say, because that'll help a little bit describing them. What happens is in, in, the, in the early fall and winter, when it starts to get very cold here, the surface of the ground cracks in some small places. And then in the spring, so almost right about now, when the snow starts to melt, that snowmelt water will trickle down into those cracks. The next winter, it will freeze. And this happens over hundreds or thousands of years of a little bit of snowmelt water falling down to a crack, it freezing. And remember, when you go from water to ice, you expand, right? If you've ever um, frozen a, a, a soda can or a water bottle, it tends to pop or break. So it actually kind of pushes the ground surface apart as these wedges form. Um, and then, you know, there that water sits. Um, in terms of sizes, though, yeah, they can be quite big. And then the way I describe them, if you've ever seen mud cracks, um, you know, sort of, uh, they want to be what we call hexagons. So like a six sided, almost looks a bit like a circle, but with some sides, um, it would like to form like those mud cracks. But of course, like mud cracks, it's not perfect. So um, these ice wedges, when you look from above, they look like almost just sort of little round circles that are all connected. In our case, they're maybe uh, 30 or 40 feet apart. So you can imagine across maybe one of these rounded mud cracks. In this case, these are um, ice wedge, you know, terrain, we call it. Um, they might be 30 or 40 feet, but they do. They're somewhat haphazard, but they tend to form and kind of coalesce together. And so um, good question. Thank you for that. Yeah, great sort of pan. We're sort of into the, again, the newer section of the tunnel. It's just a couple of years old. And we, we've been expanding the tunnel. We're starting to use more geophysical techniques to look for ice content and things like that. And we wanted to kind of create more walls and areas to go around. We can go from above. And so we've been slowly expanding the tunnel over time. And yeah, when I mentioned go up above, I didn't mean above the actual tunnel. Sorry, I meant sort of um, to give you some examples of infrastructure. So um, these are some houses that were constructed probably some 10, 20, maybe 40 years ago, again, when it was a little bit colder. Um, these are up in northwestern Alaska, an area called Point Lay. Um, that's, a, that's a village right on the coast. And as the caption says, you know, most of this house looks pretty stable, looks like it's in good shape, but notice those stairs. They just basically end about, I don't know, 10 feet above the ground surface. You can see in the distance some of those green mounds. Um, that's probably where the ground surface used to be when this house was originally constructed. Um, and you can see as the ground has basically, the, the ice wedges have melted, the permafrost has thawed. We use a term called subsidence. The ground has dropped down, down, down over time. And you can see now these stairs are fairly unusable. There's a couple other things. Oh, sorry, can you go back to that photo? So, or this yeah, one works. no problem. No, this one works too. Okay. Um, the one thing you can see, so these houses are nice and flat. So the posts the houses are sitting on are probably pretty deep down into what's still permafrost, but it's slowing from the top down. And, and, and eventually that could be a problem. You'll see these stairs and you'll see that small kind of garage door access ramp. Um, even the little the ground that bicycle's sitting on, you see all that water down there. You can kind of get a sense there was probably an ice wedge underneath this house that ice wedge melted. And remember, I said it's 99% water ice. So when you go from ice to water and that water kind of moves away, you make kind of holes in the surface. We call those thermokarst. You might have heard the term karst, um, limestone caves and things like in Florida and parts of the Midwestern US. Um, they're, that's called a karst terrain. They're kind of like holes and pockets in limestone. When frozen ground or permafrost thaws, 
and makes holes and things like that in the ground, we call that thermal karst. And so here's an example of a thermal karst feature that formed right underneath this house. And then now we're looking above at one of these houses and someone had asked about kind of what the ice wedges look like. If you look towards the top of this picture, you'll see kind of four, they look like green blobs that are somewhat lined up. Yeah, those are basically the material that the mound that's left over when ice wedges melt out. So you can kind of get a sense, maybe the lighter green material that looks like it's almost like trenches in between those darker green blobs. That's where the ice wedge used to be. And it's probably still there a little bit, it's melting out, but you'll see again, this house has kind of been, been, been sort of surrounded by water um, as these wedges have degraded and uh, the ground subsided. So big challenge. Um, here's a house, unfortunately, probably the, the thaw was deep enough that the piers, those vertical kind of pilings the house was sitting on, um, they, they're now affected. And, and this house, you know, obviously has um, run into some major challenges. Now, Tom, it's important to point out that it wasn't, these weren't bad designs or poorly built. The, these homeowners would have had no idea this was beneath the surface and they really wouldn't have anticipated the changes we're seeing now, correct? Yeah, I think that's a good answer. And, and I will say there's a bunch of people um, from the university, some of us and some others were kind of working in some of these villages to try to maybe let, you'll see those houses in the distance look like they're in pretty good shape, right? But if you had one of those houses, you might say, can you try to tell me how soon that might happen to me, or are there things I can do to slow that down or prevent it? Um, and so there's a lot of people working in some of these um, areas to try to, you know, kind of guide them in that direction. And there's a great view. So now we're looking straight up. That aerial photo, remember the little green, the, the green blobs in the pond, we're now almost sort of underneath those. And um, we would call this kind of polygonal ground or ice wedge terrain. Um, you're basically standing underneath it. And again, you can get a sense of how big these are. Um, this tunnel's quite big. You could drive a couple big trucks right through here. So it gives you a sense of scale. And so now I think we're ready to go up above. So literally this is the trees and the moss and the grass and, and whatnot, the vegetation that sits on top of the tunnel. And so we're probably 40 or 50 feet above the floor we were initially standing on. Um, this is what we would call classic boreal forest. Um, it's a lot of spruce trees, a really thick sphagnum moss layer, some shrubs and whatnot. You'll see these trees look pretty small. Um, it's a tough place to grow. Um, for one thing, the ground only thaws about maybe a foot and a half, two feet every year. So it's really hard to root down into that. It's also quite cold. These trees are probably 60 or 70 years old. Um, and if you were a forester who wanted to, you know, find wood or whatnot, this would not be a good forest to work in. Um, but they do a really nice job, the trees, the moss, and the understory of protecting the permafrost against summer warmth. So this photo, you can see it's a gorgeous summer day up there. Um, it's hot. Um, and the, this vegetation does a really nice job of protecting that permafrost from the heat. Um, that's why partly when you clear it to put buildings or roads or things on it, you can lead to you know, some of these thaw challenges. These white pipes you'll see with the sticks, we call those thermistors. They're basically, it's a fancy term for thermometer. And so what we do is we drill a hole down into the ground and we put a wire in there that basically freezes in and we can get many, many days or even years of data. And we're gonna show you an example of this. Okay, so we'll kind of walk through this. Um, so the Y axis is, is a temperature in degrees Celsius. And all of you, uh, you know, smart kids out there know that zero C is 32 Fahrenheit, which is basically the phase change from water to ice. So that gray line kind of tells you if things got warmer than zero, i.e. not permafrost, or they stayed below zero, i.e. they stayed permafrost. These are temperatures between June and October. So this is kind of our summer warm season. And then if you look at that key that says depth, um, we've got a blue one at 40 centimeters. So that's about oh, maybe a foot and a half. There's a gray one at 80 centimeters that's, you know, closer to maybe two and a half feet. And there's one at one meter that's about three feet. And so I'll go back to the blue one. Again, this is kind of shallow. And you'll notice that in the summertime, it goes above zero C. So we would not call this permafrost. This is that seasonal layer that freezes and thaws above it. Even if you don't live in permafrost, you'll have soils like this in Colorado and New Hampshire, um, you know, Oregon, Montana. Right now, if you took a shovel outside and try to dig into the ground, you wouldn't be able to, right? Because that ground's frozen. But then in the summer, it'll thaw out. And then the gray line, you'll see a little bit further down. 
Um, that one, it does warm up a little bit in the summer, but you'll see it never even gets to zero C. It gets kind of stuck. So that's probably the top of the permafrost. So we know that about probably between 60 and 80 centimeters, we have permafrost. And then the yellow line is even deeper. And this one's kind of interesting. Um, one, it, it doesn't warm up quite as much in the summer because it's further down, it's protected. And the other one you'll notice in the winter time, these colder, you know, kind of getting into uh, November and May to the right, you'll notice that one doesn't get quite as cold. And it kind of makes sense, it's further down. So it doesn't know as much that wintertime cold is sitting above it. Whereas the blue one, for instance, the shallow one, it's closest to that wintertime cold. So by tracking things like this over seasons and, and even multiple years, we can start to see what's happening with the permafrost. With that, Tom, it looks like we are ready to turn things over to Robin awesome. to talk Thank more you. about some of the source of the smell. And, and Robin's right here. Yeah, awesome. I'm going to step back. Thank you. So um, we have a oh, quiz Robin has also given us. This one's uh, another fun quiz. So uh, she's asked about the cause of the odor in the tunnel. You have a few choices, some nice uh, fragrances from Christian Dior, microbes, stinky feet from all of the guests or just the melting of ice. So take about 20 seconds here and see if you can answer that question. We'll do your introduction here in just a moment, Robin, once we've given everybody a second to think about this and respond to, it looks pretty overwhelming as it's coming in. We'll give everybody about 10 more seconds. Okay, Joe, you want to close that quiz and show everybody what we've got? Okay, we're getting a round of applause, so that is a good sign. So let me uh, let me do a quick introduction here. I, um, Dr. Robin Barbato is a microbial, microbial ecologist at the Cold Regions Research and Engineering Laboratory. She's curious about microbial life in the cold regions of the planet and loves field work. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Jason, and, and thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm really excited to talk about our research. Um, so I'm going to talk about the tiny crease, creatures above and inside of the tunnel um, and how the, the warming climate is waking up these soil microorganisms. So what are microbes? They are microscopic. You can't see them with your naked eye. And they include bacteria, archaea, fungi, protists, viruses. And, and others. And there are uh, more microbes on you and in you than your own human cells. So everyone lick your teeth. I'm gonna do it too. That slimy feeling is from bacteria. So you brush your teeth to get rid of the bacteria that are basically eating, uh, eating your teeth. So, so next I'm gonna show you um, our work on, on top of the permafrost tunnel. So climate warming is causing the soils to warm and thaw. So Tom just showed temperature changes in the soils and temperature really influences microbial growth. Um, so take a look um, of the photo on the right of me and my colleague, and you can see the boreal forest and we're studying the soils and how they breathe or respire. So microorganisms are in the soil and they're breathing and in the um, upper left is the instrument. So it's a robot that's deployed up, up there. It's called a respirometer. And then every so often it turns, it shuts, and then it starts measuring the CO2, which is carbon dioxide and, and methane. And in the, the bottom left picture is my cartoon of a soil pore. So soils um, have pores and that's where the microorganisms live. And they use the organic matter, they're in, in water. And so they're, they're breathing, they're, um, the gases are, are coming off from them. And we're looking at different patterns. So we're noticing that when it's colder, that pattern is lower, but still there. And then when it warms, that those, um, those gases are higher and that relates to, to greenhouse gases. So let's now move into the tunnel. So these, um, these photos show how we drill into the side as we hunt for microorganisms. And then in the middle, we bring it back to the laboratory and we'll, we wanna keep it frozen. And what we're doing is 
getting into the interior of the core without contaminating it. Because as I mentioned, there's more microorganisms on you and in you than your own human cells. So we cover ourselves up the best as we can, and then we get into the interior of, core, of the core. An analogy that I like to use, it's like you're licking, getting to the tootsie of a tootsie pop without licking it. So you want to get to that center to see what microorganisms are, are in there. And the picture on the right shows those what we call these these pucks of of microorganisms and so we take a look at how they're living in this frozen harsh environment um and so let me show you some photos of the beautiful microorganisms that that we have grown so i'm just going to a moment to, to let you enjoy this mosaic of bacteria and fungi that we have isolated from permafrost. And shh, don't tell NASA, but there are more microbes on Earth than stars in the sky. So in one gram of soil, which is the size of a pen cap, there's a billion bacteria and a thousand different species. And here we grow them on Petri plates and you can see that they're different colors, they're different shapes. Um, and uh, which one is your favorite? Spoiler alert, my favorite is in right in the middle. That reminds me of a sunflower, but it's not a sunflower at all. It's, it's a bacterium, a bacterium that has potentially survived tens of thousands of years. And then we take it into the laboratory and it wakes up, it begins to grow. Bacteria, fungi, other microorganisms have amazing strategies to survive harsh conditions. They can turn into spores and just hang out for thousands and thousands of years. Then it warms or maybe a beetle dies next to it hey, there's a source of food and it does something called vegetate. So it, it awakens and, and starts using that. Um, so in the next slide, I'm gonna show kind of what these microorganisms can do. And so Werner Stumm said, microbes are the best chemists in the world. So no offense to any chemists out there, but the microorganisms in the permafrost soils and in the seasonally thawed active layer, they are breaking down chemicals. They are making chemicals. And some of the neat things that they can do, um, they can help with soil aggregate formation. So having stronger soils, they make um, nutrients available to plants. They can even produce biomaterials like antifreeze. So they have strategies where they can exude chemicals that can reduce ice freezing around them. So they have a liquid phase of water to survive and proliferate and divide. So in these, uh, these circle images are our microscope images of the bacteria that we've isolated from this harsh permafrost environment. Um, and so you can see there's in the upper right, there's some red ones. We did what's called a gram stain. So we can say, oh, these are uh, gram negative bacteria. And then we start learning about their strategies for survival, what they, they prefer to utilize, um, what kind of things, things they're doing. Now, something that's come up in the chat is a, a discussion about pathogens. So most microorganisms are beneficial to, to the environment. Um, but there are some, as we know, if you've ever had a tummy ache, um, you know that some of them are harmful. And so um, uh, microbes uh, that have genes that could be harmful, they, they can turn on and, and cause challenges. And a group in France um, discovered um, and resurrected a pathogen from the frozen material but most of them are beneficial and they're creating nutrients for plants and helping those, uh, those spruce trees above to, to grow. And so here, this is a representation of the research that we're doing. So this is a picture of the tum tunnel and these little circles depict different locations in the tunnel. And within them are my cartoon representation of the microorganisms. So we're looking primarily at bacteria and fungi. And you can see that they look different in each little circle. 
where you are in the tunnel matters. So that, that drilling, that sipper core that Tom was talking about, you can see different combinations. And in there as well are microorganisms that are producing volatiles, that stinky smell, not from feet, but from bacteria like actinomyces that are living and, and making a living inside of the tunnel. And so what we wanna do is we're interested in what happens during thaw. So we take these samples back to the laboratory Laboratory. We simulate what's going to happen based on the climate predictions. And what we found out was when you thought, then a new combination of microorganisms are emerging. So even though everything is warming in the same way, we see new types of microorganisms. But what's really interesting is that they're sort of doing the same thing. So this is this big question about what the microorganism is versus what that they what they can do. And in the cartoon on the upper left, I have two microorganisms fighting against each other. They have amazing strategies. They produce antibiotics, kill my neighbor next to, to me. Oh, a symbiosis. I need this organism to live and survive. Um, and so what we found under frozen condition, the microorganisms are, mo we see a lot of evidence of them fighting against each other. Then it thaws and then they start to become more cooperative. They're trying to grow themselves. They're trying to, to survive and thrive. And so that's the, the microorganisms on the right that are, that are holding hands. Um, so the Corral Permafrost Tunnel is a really unique and amazing resource to study soil microbiology. We used to think nothing happens when it's frozen, but our research is showing that's not the case. The microorganisms are able to survive. And they're really interesting ones in there. So many that we still don't know about. So all the students in the audience, this is the amazing science that, that you can step into and do. And that climate change matters, right? Their populations are changing. So how they're helping plants, animals will continue to change. So thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Thank you very much, Robin. So we had a question about viruses. Do you find viruses there as well as bacteria? Yeah, there are viruses uh, in, in the tunnel. They're smaller and, and, and challenging to, to study. However, new research is showing that you can um, look at their DNA or RNA, their nucleic acids to figure out which viruses um, are there. Um, and, and they can attack uh, bacteria, they can attack fungi, so yes. And another question, what methods do you use to count these or to study them? Do you have to grow them in a culture or is there some other DNA analysis, all of the above? All the above. So good thing is, or at least we don't know, microorganisms have no feelings. So in the laboratory, we take away their outer, outer membrane and we look at those nucleic acids. We use databases to match them to them and, and, and figure out what types of microorganisms are there, what genes that they have. We look at their metabolites, what they're producing, their enzymes, the action of the cell breaking down different um, molecules that's, that are found in soil. Um, so we do a, a range of methods to try to understand these tiny microscopic creatures that we just can't see usually with our naked eye. There, thank you very much, Robin. Appreciate all your time today and sharing in the information about the microbes and why it smells so bad in the tunnel. Yeah, thank you. Bye, everyone. So we're going to do a little a question and answer. We're going to invite Tom back. Uh, we have some outstanding questions about the tunnel. We also have two additional individuals who are going to join us. Mike Brubaker lives in Anchorage and works with communities to understand the effects of climate change. One of his projects is the Local Environmental Observer Network or LEO Network, a website where people anywhere can share stories about environmental change they're experiencing. There are many stories in the LEO Network about permafrost and local damage to infrastructure like houses and schools. And if you wanna learn more about that, you can visit the LEO Network by directing your browser there. Also, Jennifer Moss is an instructional designer and adjunct faculty at the University of Alaska Fairbanks with over 25 years of experience in academics and higher education. Her interests include how open education and emergent technologies can work together to provide equitable and successful learning experiences for all ages. And I'd like to thank Jennifer and also Eric, her colleague, Eric Lawn at the University of Alaska Fairbanks that helped collect all the footage with Tom that makes up the tunnel tour that you can explore on your own.
So we'll, we'll start out with a question we've got getting from quite a few people, which is, um, what does this mean for infrastructure where people live? Like, what does it mean for roads? What does it mean for houses? We obviously saw some pictures and, and is this gonna continue into the future? So maybe we'll start uh, Mike or Jennifer by their view. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it is something that will continue to evolve in, into the future. And I can say currently uh, I am building a house uh, and it has to have a permafrost and this is in Fairbanks. Uh, it has to have a permafrost foundation that so that if the permafrost thaws under the house that we're building, um, that it will be safe uh, and, and won't collapse in, in the ways that sometimes infrastructure does. I guess what I would add is um, permafrost is a great substrate. It's great in the ground to build on when it's solid, but when it starts to thaw and the land starts to change, it creates all kinds of different challenges. And uh, like Tom and Robin, I like to use candy or ice cream analogies. So I, I always picture you're, you're putting a little house on top of an ice cream sandwich and just waiting for the ice cream center to melt. And that's kind of what happens and what we see in communities all over Alaska is this thawing and sinking like the pictures you saw and then problems with opening doors, problems with foundations, problems with windows cracking and those kinds of things. So uh, there's a lot of great work being done to try to figure out how to build better and how to make buildings more resilient and communities more resilient to climate change. So one of the questions that came in is, are there resources available, state and local government to help communities with this change? Or is it really dependent largely on themselves to figure out what to do and where to get the resources? I'll take a, you know, a, I, I'll take a swing on that one. So um, there, there, it's been it's been growing over time, and one of the big challenges is when you have whole communities that are seeing lots of different impacts from permafrost. It's very difficult to move a, a an entire community to more solid ground. It's been done, and that's what's happening. But doing that is very difficult. What's a lot easier is to move slowly over time. So every time you build a new house, every time you build a new school, trying to find the best possible location. And when you relocate or rebuild something, put it someplace where it will last longer. And um, now there's more and more resources available probably than ever before for communities to begin to do the planning and also to do the smart building to make, them, to make themselves ready for the future and to find those good places where the permafrost will not be so impactful. We've had a few questions coming about roads. It looks like we have some individuals maybe in Alaska or the have visited Denali National Park that have asked about deteriorating road conditions and if permafrost thaw and ice wedges melt or thawing has been a result of some of that deterioration. I, I can I can address this a little bit. So First, I'll say the Alaska Department of Transportation is probably the coolest DOT of them all because they have to, if you think of just the sheer amount of space they have to deal with and things like permafrost and landslides and earthquakes and volcanoes and glaciers, you name the natural hazard and, and, and they're dealing with it. Um, they use a lot of really cool sort of engineering and, and research, but still it's very challenging to build and maintain roads. And, and in some ways, maybe the road was put in a location that today you'd say, ah, I would never put a road there. And yet it's a, it's an important, you know, way to get from point A to point B. So they have to kind of maintain it. Um, things like the Pretty Rocks landslide in Denali Park and a lot of roads that are kind of like roller coasters here in Fairbanks are related to you know, permafrost degradation. Um, we know that's going to increase and continue. Um, and we do hope things like the permafrost tunnel and some of our other studies um, and, and some of these larger efforts like the permafrost gateway that Anna's leading will help people sort of coalesce on their data. And sort of back to the question that Mike addressed, a lot of the villages are just increasingly finding more and more challenges. And there are multiple sort of layers of people and entities that are helping. But I think the, the scope of the challenge and the rate of change is more rapid than kind of government or you know, engineering type solutions provide. Um, and so I think this is going to be an emerging challenge. So I guess I'll throw it out to any 
students out there thinking of going into engineering, there is a ton of work, a lot of need. Um, and we need smart people with cool ideas um, to help us along this path. Thank you. So Jennifer, in the educational space, I guess those locally, is there efforts underway to educate them about changes in building practices? And then those of us living elsewhere in the world, lower 48, what should we do in order to avoid contributing to thaw permafrost? Well, how can we you, that information be shared with us in the lower 48? Uh, well, there's a number of organizations around town, like the Cold Climate Research Center, um, but also uh, in terms of the Permafrost Discovery Gateway Project that we are working on, uh, we will be developing some resources that will go on an education component of that site, and along with lesson plans that are uh, based on the next generation science standards um, that will help students um, in Alaska and the, the Arctic and subarctic regions to explore some of the um, in, some of the changes that are happening uh, across the Arctic and with permafrost and think about um, ways to think about it in terms of what's happening in their communities and ways to learn more about that. So, so our, reaching the end of we're reaching the end of our program here. So I wanna give each of our panelists here 20 seconds for a closing comment they wanna share with the audience since we have a, you know, a few hundred people here on the, uh, the event today. So we'll start with you, Mike. Oh, I just really enjoyed the tour and it's fun to be on a call with everybody and be able to share a little bit on this topic. Um, I would say, you know, it's an interesting change in the world where um, it used to be 50 years ago that things would just seasonally return to the way they were. And it was very dependable, mostly, about the way things are. And that's the world I grew up in. And now it's changing. And uh, it's hard for people who are my age to, to watch that happen. But there's a whole new world, and that is where you never know quite what's going to happen next. Change is the normal. And for people that there's excitement to that and there's challenges, but it's just a different way to approach the planet. If we wanna help permafrost, I think uh, be a leader through your example, um, try to uh, get people to turn off the lights and ride a bicycle and encourage um, ways to cut down on carbon dioxide wherever you can. We're, we're trying to do the same thing here um, in our organization. And I think that's a, a model that everyone needs to happen in order to prevent climate change um, from proceeding at, at this rate. Jennifer, closing comments? Yeah, I'd like to just echo uh, what Mike said, uh, and also just to say that we need some radical innovators uh, coming into the next generations. We need uh, engineers and new policy making that will help, um, help protect the permafrost uh, areas and, and the world in general in terms of climate change. So thank you. And Tom? Just first, thank you everyone for putting this together and participating. Um, Jason, you've been an awesome moderator. Um, there's the info on the Permafrost Gateway. Check that out. I, I think or hope this will kind of be a recorded video that people could access and share. Um, and I think one list, final comment, you know, we in the science and engineering world, you saw a couple of us today, but um, there's a lot of diversity of experiences and ideas and uh, what kind of family you came from, what you're into, your creativity level, uh, your nerdiness. I think mine's on the high level, but that's okay. Um, we sort of welcome anybody that wants to kind of come into this field, and we really do have a lot of challenges. And so um, it's definitely for all the students out there, study hard, take your math, you know, grin and bear it on your chemistry and, and, and come help us address these problems. And, and thanks for tuning in. So we have one more little, uh, little thing to show everybody before we sign off today. I would like to give a call out to Daniel Hamilton, who's uh, one of our student interns at the Bird Center who assembled this tour and has done a number of updates over the last month or so. We had a lot of questions here, a lot of questions we couldn't answer. We will be posting those to everybody in about three or four days. We're going to send them to the wider permafrost community to get answers to those. So you'll receive a follow-up email that'll have that information. It'll also include a brief survey and a link to the recording of today. But I do want to show a video about the Permafrost Discovery Gateway, because this is a project that provided the, the time and resources to create this event. Uh, 
Anna Littledahl is the permafrost is a permafrost hydrologist at the Woodwell Climate Research Center. Um, she's nearly 20 years of experience in the field, doing numerical modeling, and in recent years developing a passion for enabling big data permafrost science. She's going to give an overview of the gateway real fast on a video recording, um, and she's also the team leader of this project. Thank you again for everybody for joining us today. Permafrost is thawing in the Arctic and subarctic and causing ecosystem changes, structural damage, and releasing large amounts of carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere. Researchers have been working hard to understand more about permafrost changes and the long-term consequences for our world, but there is still a lot to learn and understand. Vast amounts of imagery have been collected by satellites and many different models have been created for visualizing permafrost. But until now, there has been no way to get a more holistic view of big permafrost data on a global scale. The Permafrost Discovery Gateway is an online tool that's in development and aggregates massive amount of permafrost data and different types of big data as well from satellites and models and, and it generates spatial information using machine learning techniques. And it's an open tool that everyone will be able to use and access and even contribute to. And it will provide powerful visualization and exploration features that uh, will support scientific understanding of the Arctic. On the gateway, you can zoom into a specific area for a close perspective, view different types of informational layers, and data can be downloaded for new analysis. One example of the machine learning the gateway will employ is through analyzing satellite imagery of features like ice-rich polygons. These shapes are formed through the seasonal freeze-thaw cycle, causing soil to crack and buckle. The gateway will be able to create sub-meter resolution vectors of polygon boundaries across the entire Arctic. Another layer is the LEO network, where crowdsourced permafrost news is aggregated from across the globe. Anyone can participate in the LEO network, so this is one way that you will be able to contribute back to the gateway. Immersive experiences like the virtual permafrost tunnel tour are also part of the gateway that allow anyone to virtually visit and connect deeper with permafrost land features. Other layers include data on changing lakes and waterways, and these are just a few examples of the types of data visualization that the gateway contains. As development continues, our team will add additional layers to the gateway for you to explore. Our website will also offer features specifically designed for educators. Lesson plans are being developed that teachers can build upon that include learning activities for using the gateway with students. Our hope is to create a comprehensive resource that will enable teachers and students to connect with real world data and modeling to build excitement for the next generation of scientists, engineers, climate leaders, and policymakers. You can visit the Permafrost Discovery Gateway at this web address. See you there.